face mites. Let's talk about it. Do you ever feel insecure about your appearance? Do you ever compare yourself to others? Well, one quick remedy to help this is to remember that everyone, even your favorite celebrity heartthrob, all have tiny mites crawling around their faces at all times. Their scientific name is Demodex, which comes from the Greek meaning fat and boring worm. They may be fat and boring, but they're not worms. They're actually part of the arachnid family and related to spiders, but it'll be difficult to catch them and put them out into the garden as they're roughly a third of the size of a pinhead. But why are these mites found specifically on the human face and not elsewhere on the body? Well, the creatures are attracted to oily skin and your face is dripping with the stuff. They survive by drinking the sebum produced by your sebaceous glands and eating the insides of your dead skin cells. They live in the hair follicles on your forehead, cheeks and nose, or in the oil producing glands surrounding those follicles. They also don't have anuses, storing all their feces in their abdomens until they die when they leak that matter all over your face. Surviving without a head, let's talk about it. As you may have guessed, it is incredibly difficult to survive without a head. But if you do find yourself in the unfortunate position of having lost your head, here are some interesting facts about your newfound situation. Before you inevitably die, you will lose consciousness. Consciousness requires a constant supply of oxygen, and the severance of blood vessels would be a real issue when maintaining this supply. It's probably apocryphal, but Anne Boleyn supposedly tried to speak after she was beheaded by Henry VIII. But could that actually happen? In a trial conducted on decapitated mice, scientists found that electrical activity continued in the brain at frequencies that indicate conscious activity for four seconds after decapitation. If this study is applicable to humans, it could mean that you would be able to give one final disapproving look to whoever just decapitated you. That'll show them. However, some animals with different physiology to humans are able to survive for a limited time after their head has been removed. For example, Mike the Headless Chicken. In 1945, a farmer beheaded a chicken who continued to live for about 18 months. This was because a blood clot prevented the bird from bleeding to death and its brainstem was left intact. As the brainstem is responsible for the chicken's breathing, heart rate and reflex actions, it could remain relatively healthy. The farmer then travelled around America with the chicken as part of a touring show, along with a two-headed baby. What a double act. Zombie fungus. Let's talk about it. I'm the most indecisive person I know, and sometimes I just wish that someone else could make all my decisions for me. Well, for some insects, that is exactly what happens. Zombie fungus, scientifically known as Orpheocordyceps unilateralis, attaches its spores to an insect and infiltrates its body. We'll use ants as an example. It then takes control of its central nervous system and releases chemicals which alter the ant's neurochemistry and manipulate its behavior. It therefore, starts making all of their decisions for them. The fungus compels the ant to leave its colony, climb vegetation and head towards light. This warm and humid environment is the perfect condition for the fungus to grow and spread. The next stage of the zombification process is called death grip. The infected ant, under the influence of the fungus, uses its jaw to clamp onto a leaf and subsequently dies. After the ant's death, the fungus spreads throughout the carcass, ultimately emerging from the ant's head to release new spores, which fall to the ground below to infect more ants. So not a particularly fun guy after all. Immortal jellyfish. How's that possible? Being an adult is tough, and sometimes you find yourself longing for the simpler times of childhood. Well, for some jellyfish, this is possible. The immortal jellyfish, scientifically known as the Turritopsis dornai, starts off as an egg and then grows into a larva. This larva then attaches to a solid seabed surface where it grows into a polyp. Once the polyp is big enough, it starts to bud off and the adult jellyfish, known as the medusa, and floats off into the ocean. But when the immortal jellyfish reaches adulthood, it can revert its cells back to their earliest form, the polyp, essentially starting its life cycle again. 
This process is called transdifferentiation. This cycle can repeat indefinitely under the right conditions, meaning it will never die of old age, and giving the jellyfish the appearance of biological immortality. Returning to its polyp is like pressing the restart button on its own life. Each and every time I embarrass myself in a social situation, I wish I was an immortal jellyfish and I could just press restart and have another go. The lake that turned you into stone. Let's talk about it. Imagine this. You're on a trip of a lifetime, traveling solo across the great African plains. You gaze out across the strange red waves of Lake Natron, and you're so happy that you want to live in the moment forever. Well, it turns out you can. Because of Lake Natron's unique composition, those who spend too long in its waters will be turned into stone, preserving their bodies in that special moment. Tanzania's Lake Natron is a salt lake and the perfect breeding ground for a type of poisonous algae called Arthrospira, which gives the water its blood red color. The lake is also highly alkaline, reaching levels as high as 10.5 pH, which is similar to household detergent and ammonia. This is because lava, which is rich in sodium and potassium carbonate, runs into the lake from the surrounding volcanic area. When animals die in or around the lake, the high levels of sodium carbonate in the water preserve their bodies. In fact, the lake's water has a very similar chemical makeup to the solution ancient Egyptians used to embalm bodies. This liquid prevents decomposition from taking place and turns their bodies into calcified statues, leaving the shore looking like an overspill from a gargoyle factory specializing in deceased birds. Amazingly, flamingos are not affected by the lake's harsh conditions because of their hard skin and scaly legs which prevent burns. So, if like Medusa, you want to turn someone into stone, your best chance is to send them on an all-expense pay trip of a lifetime to Lake Natron. Simulation theory. What's it all about? Have you ever been accused of having main character syndrome just because you sometimes forget people's birthdays or occasionally make everything about yourself? Well, according to simulation theory, you are in fact life's protagonist. Simulation theory suggests that our reality as we know it does not exist. Instead, we're being controlled by more advanced beings in a simulation and that our perception of free will has been pre-programmed. In the same way that we build worlds in video games and role play as other people, something out there is manipulating our every move. So the next time you're being weird at work, we'd recommend using the I'm being controlled by a higher being excuse. We're sure this will really clear things up nicely. This theory is most vocally supported by Nick Bostrom, a philosophy professor at Oxford University. He believes that because our universe is governed by mathematical laws with apparently arbitrary constants, a powerful enough computer has the potential to simulate it exactly. If simulations of universe are possible, you could theorize that our entire known universe and others alongside it are simulated. And it would be convenient for advanced beings to run millions or even billions of simulations simultaneously. And so applying this theory, the likelihood of us being part of the only world that isn't simulated is statistically very unlikely. One hole in this argument is that if a life force has programmed our consciousness, then surely they wouldn't program us to ask such probing questions. Or maybe they would. By questioning our own consciousness, maybe we've upgraded a level. A lot of this theory is based on a lot of assumptions that we are unable to test. So many scientists believe we should rule out this thought experiment completely. Or maybe they've just been programmed to say that.